You laugh now, you floozies. But not one of you will escape once he's on the island. I know the cunning rogue he is. He's patient, evasive, and suddenly at the right moment when you least expect it, he's on top of you. Once again, the sirens spring me on my journey, poised, erect, chanting in the wind, and the voracious voices balance my soul between a yes and no. Rise, Odysseus, bend your agile mind like a bow and rend the mist. Do I reason like a mortal? In my breast, I embrace a god as I cast about. I battled the Stygian waves, and clinging to the waterlogged tiller, I conquered death again. Lightning bolts blind me, and my godlike mind blurs. Athena, Athena, I shout, release me, prevent the gods, my lady, from using me as fodder for carrying crows. Burst from my head, fully armed. Recall the many years we strove together. You bunkered down on my brow as I lay in the sun. Descend upon the earth and tend my hot heart, lest it burst. Old timer, why are you shouting? Why yank your hair like an offended widow? On your feet. Haven't you learned after so many years to govern terror? And yet, you're not timid. You stand on your own two feet with soul and body well suited to each other. Brace yourself. It's time to cast your willpower like a spear on fate's scale, and it will tip your way since a mortal's heart holds the reins. Words land on my heart like aged wine, which rouses manhood and steadies wobbly knees. Looks and stature, you appear goddess, and I kneel to kiss your immortal feet. Behold how the sea has battered me like a pebble and heaved me about on the surface of massive waves. I, I seek not pity, but respect for man's sea-drenched mind. Lay hands on me, and set a castaway free both from earth and sea. However, if you're the offspring of mortal man, Blessed is your father and mother, and thrice blessed the man who will share your nuptial bed. <laughs> your tongue rebounds, stranger, as it weaves its praise and manipulates the shuttle, embroidering timely ornaments on its cloth. But first, reveal your lawful name in the council that adjudged you to the waves. I'm a merchant from Phoenicia called Much Enduring. In my swift ship, I sailed the azure seas of Greece, dealing in fancy fragrances, multi-breathed goddesses, coarse demons, and translucent magnets, and even fighters. I told everything a woman needs, my lady, to ensnare her man. And every evening, Mother Astarte's blessings were upon us night and day, the, that earthen form replete with the weighty breath which resuscitates life. I worshipped her, prostrate on the seashore, hoping to bring profit from to my trade. Ah, young maidens to repose on an evening upon the warm Venetian sand at a certain vermilion feet during our erotic, drunken fest. One could sweetly coo sighs like a turtle dove and embraced shout, never again will I return to Greece. What sweetness trickles from your lips? Like a honeybee sensing an exquisite flower, my soul remains sleepless at your words. Wretched, I, re I reconstruct my former fortunes, forgetting how my journey went, exalted now in the ocean of death. And you, Sidon, oh, frightful master of the sea, who disrespect man's grief and efforts, the day will come to give account. Fair lady. In your gentle faith, I glint mortality and compassion. Uh, pity an old man and make known to me on whose land again the god that sent me. Why are you silent? Tell me the whole truth and don't be troubled. I, my heart endured far and wide to hear the truth that is now capable and willing. Cunning, long-suffering Odysseus. 
who suckled falsehoods at the breast. Your mind, like a deep water fisherman, strives to cast far its tightly woven nets. Your agile mind is like a honeycomb, which slowly drips its honey. For your devotion, I nurtured you, and from Olympus's highest peak toiled to deify your hands and mind. Now necessity dispatches me, and here I am, like an Amazon by your side. Athena. Don't be frightened. You arrive now, when I found myself on terra firma and no longer fear the gaping mouth of the ocean? But where was your love, Athena, when you sauntered with the gods and I struggled on the rotten raft and in the cave? Now you stand beside me to easily share my current feats. Yet, I love you, for only you reveal to me Olympus' secret. Come near me, loyal companion of mortals, and whisper the name of the land the god cast me. Shame on the immortals, the hapless, fleeing mortal, and yet I will defeat them. You stand on native soil and bend like a slender bow, oblivious. My mind takes flight. This barren island, this narrow wasteland devoid of water and light, utterly beguiles and restrains me. How can my decrepit soul fit within a narrow sparrow's nest? Where's our towering mountain, the thick set trees, and our round, fathomless lakes? Oh, self-effacing and fair at all see. Don't beat your head against the rocks, but open wide your eyes with gratitude. Look, I dissipate the mist. There lies your native mountain, its defiant trees murmuring on its slopes. There the olive groves, the vineyards and the pines. Before you spread out the windless lake. There the nymph's cave with its single olive tree. Nearby old Eumaeus's hut, in the divine arresting view of Ithaca. Oh, land of my father, ancestral seashore, forests and mountains. I feel entrenched again in my country. I accrue new energy and sprout new roots like an enduring oak. Oh, Ithaca, Telemachus, a wife, and sacred smoke rising above the roof of my paternal home. Holy burial ground on the edge of open sea, I greet you all. Brace yourself and point your prow towards new mortal struggles. Take note that the troublemakers celebrate your life, merrymaking to the melody of the lyre, which resonates in your halls throughout the day. Don't fret, goddess, for I mean to bury all these freeloaders and like sacrificial bulls decapitate them before your altar and snuff out their body songs to silence their harsh-sounding lyre. Yet, a snake still coils around my soul. R reply, Athena. Flash before my eyes what I want to ask, but cannot say. Two options are attainable. Yes and no. It's our few, but to the point, goddess. Yes or no. And my son. He was waiting for his father and regardful of his earliest memories of you was working to imitate you. But now. Now. He's come of age and no longer wants to remain in his father's shadow. He set off to Sparta to ascertain your death and finally shed your royal carcass from his shoulders so he can breathe. If you're dead, rest in peace. Better off. And my old man? He's an infant again. Does he remember me? His mind withers. Everything clouds over. He's burnt out. And you're fading from his mind. Immortals, I extol you. The once again, you pelt my head with torments. My agile mind, like an octopus with endless tentacles and seven lives, roams the salty brine. When one is lost, a colossal other takes its place, replete with mouths and hungers. Don't be in a hurry. Hold tight the reins and control your rage and ardor. 
And when you catch sight of home, muscle like a dog, your heart from barking. You need not counsel me. I understand very well to keep my thoughts to myself. It's time for me to leave. I see your faithful swineherd panting by the rocks. Look at him struggling, remember him? Don't tremble. <laughs> You're crying, my esteemed Odysseus. How fast you mislay your heroic stature. It's time to show endurance. And when you happen upon those you cherish, how will you act? Rise up, steal yourself, and drown your every futile yearning. Knock dauntlessly on your palace door, even though your lion heart crumbles. The time for your assault will come. Embrace it. Hi, welcome to Reading Greek Tragedy Online. I'm Joel Christensen from Brandeis University, and I'm here with uh, Maria Xanthu and the whole Reading Greek Tragedy Online crew from the Center for Atlantic Studies, Out of the Chaos Theater, and the Cosmos Society. Today we're really excited because we're introducing a play that I don't believe has been performed in English online ever, um, or really on, on stage in English um, in very long. This is Costas Mercedes translation of Nikos Katsunakis's um, Odysseus, A Verse Tragedy. Um, and it's fascinating uh, for many reasons. One, it's fascinating for the period it comes from in the history of Greek literature. It's amazing for its engagement with um, Greek epic and myth. Um, and it's also just wonderful because it gives us a different way of thinking about Odysseus and his homecoming, um, which is a pretty amazing thing. Um, so you just saw the, the first scene between Athena and Odysseus, and it really echoes what happens in book 13 of the Odyssey. Um, but there's more than meets the eye here. Uh, so one of the reasons I'm super excited uh, to bring Maria Xanthu back today um, is because she's not only just an expert um, on ancient Greek literature, but she knows far more than any of us do about modern Greek literature too. Um, so Maria, welcome. Um, tell us a little bit about this opening scene and what it what it invokes for you. Thank you very much for inviting me, Joel. And I'm really very happy to join uh, all these uh, excellent actors and out of chaos uh, um, theater group. Uh, I'm really excited in uh, in presenting with you uh, Nikos Kazantzakis' Odyssey. As you already mentioned, it's the first time that the Odyssey is performed. Uh, I'm not sure, and I know well about uh, Nikos Kazantzakis' uh, work uh, here in Greece and uh, abroad. It's, a, it's probably the first time that the Odyssey has been performed. Uh, although it, it, it was composed as um, a poem, as an epic poem in 1924 by Kazantzakis, uh, this poem is quite controversial from uh, many points uh, of views. Uh, first, uh, uh, let me tell you that uh, Kosas Mirsiadis translation is the second translation after, after Kimon Friar's translation uh, of this specific word into English. Uh, the Odyssey uh, was composed in 1924 by Kazantzakis. Kazantzakis was what I would call a literary torrent for modern Greek uh, literature. He is uh, really a, an overwhelming figure of uh, Greek literature and I would say of world literature. Uh, he was most popular during, uh, whether you believe it or not, in the 60s or in the 50s, where, for example, Joda Sen and uh, Melina Mercuri um, produced uh, a film, uh, uh, The Christ uh, Recrucified, and it was very successful. Uh, and uh, then uh, Martin Scorsese uh, uh, directed The Last Temptation. And then nobody <laughs> talked about Nikos Kazantzakis uh, again. Um, his work is really very... Uh, Great. Uh, and let me just give you some uh, overview. He wrote about philosophy. He wrote tra travel uh, uh, literature about different parts of the world he traveled. 
he um, composed uh, poetry, but most importantly, and uh, I'm an eyewitness on this, he was the first, his work is really very, uh, to translate um, the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, together with a great uh, classicist and Homerist, uh, whom you already know, Joel, Kakridis, uh, John Kakridis. Mm. And uh, it was really a unique achievement because both Kakridis and Kazantzakis uh, try to translate Iliad into not only the demotic, you know, the everyday Greek language that the people use, but also use some local uh, dialectic uh, types and forms. Uh, and by the way, whether you believe it or not, I'm one of the students. We were taught the Iliad in, and the Odyssey in school uh, by the translation of, 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 through the translation by Kazantzakis Kakridis. Mm. Uh, yes, and uh, although it was uh, quite, um, translation was quite sui generis, and uh, I must confess, even uh, we as uh, children were you know, sometimes find it uh, a, a bit extreme because it had it in it, it uh, had these localisms. Um, but anyway, so um, back to the uh, back to the Odyssey. The Odyssey, Kazantzakis' Odyssey, again is a very idiosyncratic uh, uh, work because in its original language. And unfortunately, now this is where translation comes in. You can also see that uh, Kazantzakis has used a uh, language of local color. Mm -hmm. I think this has to do also with the fact that uh, Kazantzakis was from Crete and he tried to revive uh, the local uh, dialect of Crete, but also he was a, co a committed I must say, a uh, demoticist. He wanted people to use demotic Greek language. Okay. Now, regarding the critical appraisal of the work, I must say that literary critics are divided because they, they cannot grasp, they cannot fathom, they, ca they cannot realize what kind of work Odyssey is. Uh, people think that it is modern and postmodern. They think that uh, um, Kazantzakis was influenced with, uh, because he lived in Paris for many years, he, so he, uh, um, he joined the philosophers, the modern, uh, the modern artistic trends in Paris back in 1920s. Uh, they think that still um, it is an understudied work in terms of artistic influences, so they cannot appreciated. However, there is, um, let's say, uh, they try to do it through uh, another method. For example, another great poet, poet uh, a Greek poet, um, Seferis, wrote also his version of Odyssey, Mythistorima. So they try in a way either to compare, for example, Seferis and the Kazantzakis, or even James Joyce's Ulysses with Kazantzakis' Odyssey. Mm. Although I must say, and this is again a very crucial information for our audience, that Kazantzakis' Odyssey picks up Odysseus exactly from the moment he, dis he returns to Ithaca. Uh, Odysseus stays for some uh, time on Ithaca, but then he departs again because he is looking for new adventures. Mm -hmm. The Odyssey moves between back and forth through time. Uh, I'm not saying that it is like um, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, a fantasy, but he's combining modern historical um events but in a in a, uh, but according to Kazantzakis mm. so the final and this is the declaimer and the sorry for the spam uh, uh 
Kazantzakis, for, for the spoiler alert, Kazantza, uh, Odysseus dies on Antarctica, which is quite unique and fascinating. Okay. So uh, here, what I would say about this particular uh, part that uh, we heard is that you see that uh, Athena and uh, Odysseus are formed in a different way uh, than uh, in Homer. As you can see, there's, there is in a way like um, an underlying um, uh, how can I say, not a conflict, mm. but in a way uh, Odysseus disagrees, like he says, where have you been? And Athena says, okay, come on, get up and move on. I mean, this get up and move on, I would say it's uh, Kazantzakis' uh, uh, motto through his life, like the man should get up and fight. Mm. So what I love about this, and there's so much I would love to talk to you about, but just to focus a, a bit, is comparing this to, to book 13 of the Odyssey. Um, Cousin Zakis has, has he's picked on some of the tones that are hard to detect there, and he's explored him, right? Like in the in Homer's Odyssey, there's a little bit of suspicion between Athena and Odysseus, and it's more playful. But here, he's really found that space, and he's expanded it. And so what, when I read his work, I really feel like I'm in the tradition of, say, Quintus Smyrnaeus in the post-America, just, you know, 1500 years later, adding in all this myth and history and making it something, you know, new, but also old at the same time. And that's where I think is sort of local dialect preferences um, and is engaging with variant myths and also introducing new things um, makes it so powerful. I mean, it, it's really just sort of fascinating. Um, so, I mean, I think maybe part of the challenge of, of, of reading the text is its scale. So for people who, who are still sort of struggling with what this text is, um, the Odyssey of Modern Sequel is, is 24 books and, and runs to about 30, 33,000 lines. So it's roughly twice the length of the Homeric Odyssey. Um, and what we have with this verse play is what some people are calling a, um, a, a prequel to it sort of setting us up and sort of providing a bridge from the uh, rereading the end of the Odyssey and setting us up for this Odysseus who goes abroad. Um, now, we'll talk about this again a bit at the next break, Maria, but part of what, what he's playing with there is what other poets in the late Romantic Age and early Modern Age also found as well, which is all of this uncertainty about what happens to Odysseus after the end of the epic. Um, had myths spawned in, uh, in the past and just offers space for people to imagine um, this aging hero uh, in this world after he's returned home. Um, so before we get go back to the performance, Maria, um, what are some themes or interactions that you're looking for in this play that help us to understand uh, more or less what it's about? Sorry. Sorry. No, no, no. So what are you looking for in the next few scenes to sort of clue us into uh, what this play is really about? Well, um... Kazantzakis' approach is very different from Homer's. So he he's trying not to be subservient, as you said, to, to the Homeric tradition, but he also wants to do something new. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we already saw what we're going to see is uh, in a way anticipated by Athena. Because when, he did, when Odysseus asks um, uh, um, Athena, like, how is my the members of uh, my family? Athena gives some really uh, very groundbreaking answers. Like, for example, he uh, he she tells she tells about Telemachus like being, you know, he has come of age. Uh, he is trying to get uh, um, like uh, to get over his uh, uh, father's shadow. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when uh, also Odysseus asked about his father, he said like, uh, you know, yes, his mind withers away, but okay, he's okay. This is something very new. I mean, this is a new perception of how Odysseus will deal with his uh, family members. Of mm -hmm. course, you know, I mean, 
the motive that he will probably slaughter uh, the shooters is uh, here again. But uh, again, we have to see how he's going to deal with the shooters. And most importantly, what he didn't ask, and we are about to see, I hope, is how he, he is going to approach Penelope, his wife. Mm. And, and so I, I, you're totally right there. So it, it's almost deceptive how closely um, Kazanakis uh, reads the Odyssey and changes it. And one of the things to mention for those of you who are interested in this play is the first scene that we skipped is actually seen of the enslaved women at the beginning who are in the Odyssey uh, in Odysseus's household. And in a way, I think Kazanakis uh, has anticipated almost a hundred years work by Penelope by uh, Atwood and the Penelope app, really making us think about the people who live in the household and fleshing out what's going on there. So in this next scene, we're going to meet the swineherd Eumaeus, um, and we'll move one step closer um, to entering the household. Oh, master, you're lost and leave your home in ruins. Your eagle plume falls on earth and no longer casts a shadow, a shield for your son, your wife, and me, and a dread to others. What avenger will appear to bend your great bow? Stop your laments, my good man. Only songs become his grave. I ask you, have you no respect for youth? Even if the old man is gone, I take his place to fight in Greece. I, I reach to clasp the spear from his lifeless hands and cast it with his blessing beyond his furthest aim. Triple the glory for him who, before he dies, attains a worthy son to snatch from his palm his sturdy spear for heroic deeds. <laughs> I too would like my golden years pillaged by sons, strength and honor. Did you mourn his death, my son? I paid a son's dues to his father, and to the enchanted wine, Hel Helen's lily hand cast an herb and at once soothed my mind. And pacified my heart. Her voice like water refreshed my soul. Uh, have no regrets. It's time, brave lads, to reap the immortal gifts of heroes and have the earth reverberate your names. Yet yeah, you abandon your life to the suitors by refusing to lift your head. They circle your mother like hounds while you anxiously search the sea, waiting for an old man's hand to save you. You want to follow him? Pick up his spears and head for the palace for revenge. Old man, you change before my eyes. You come alive. You awake in me past memories of bliss and daring. But how can I take on so many by myself? By not counting. Make up your mind and fall into the fray with Cusco and you'll triumph. And do you think the gods will keep me company? They will if you succeed. I know them. They always pursue the victor to feed on remnants like crows. My hut wakes. How your mind shines, old timer, like a light, a flame. Whoever endures and returns death's conqueror, my son, grasps that the seed of freedom is the human heart. Prepare to go beyond the bounds of mortality. Yes. Just like you, I imagine my world-renowned father. Yeah, should you stand up, I believe your head would topple our roof. Undaunted, you change moods, laughing and crying, but now like a demanding god, you rant and rave. I can morph into a thousand forms, an infant, an old man, even water, fire and air, or a great toxic bow which bends like a viper in the sun and slinks away willowy with a brood and mad as hell. Who are you? My heart beats out of control. How you gawk, my shepherd. I'm not a phantom. I'm alive. Touch me. My strong, lean bones bind me, and inside my soul dwells like a queen. In every port I stopped, I was cunning, a spinner of tales. I sold worthless merchandise as if gold, all lies. Can anyone consider real anything sold by one in rags? And if you truly think I'm Daedalus, old man, it's because your mind is overcome with hunger. 
I now disclose to you a great lie. <laughs> Stand before me with attention. I am. Are you uneasy? Tell me, who are you? Odysseus. <laughs> there. A lie. Man's divine right, which, like Cerberus, scares me to death. An easy victory no longer interests me, nor do I accept. Down now, old timer, spread a blanket for me in your courtyard. I overdrank this evening, and I mouthed off more than I should. Old father, I'm going to keep you close to my heart tonight, so I can cope but my two hands clutch earth. Oh, I curse the day I was born. I'm tired of the light. I pound the door on the cool earth and scream. It seems you bring me more misfortunes. My eyes cloud over. What is the darkness glistens your hands? My father's bow. You're back, my boy. I bow before you. Welcome. What a sweet comfort to our loneliness. And the master? He decays in the ocean's depths. You think the master would disappear before reaching home to demand justice? Not possible. No. He has seven lives. Don't fret. He lives and reigns. He reigns in your deranged mind, but he no longer casts his shadow upon the earth. I already see his dark shadow near the island, mounting the hill rock by rock. There he is, entering the courtyard. The dags, the dogs are howling. Who knows whether or not he casts anchor in one of the island's secluded harbors. He's cunning, and once he docks, I know him. He won't openly appear. First, he'll scout for those loyal and those laying traps for him. He won't even open up his heart to his own son before he firms up the nets in the twisted workings of his mind. Eurycleia, all is lost if we place our hopes on blind fate. Eurycleia? Oh, how you aged, my good woman. Your breasts bag. Your white hair once glistened like crow's feathers on your wondrous shoulders. But who is this fellow again in rags? These paupers pester my master like crows over carrion. Take heed, old mother. The bow. Why remove it from its old post? I ordered that it hang there to guard the house and not be touched. What can I say, my son? Why cry? Did my mother send it? Tell me. Please don't ask. Did my mother send it? Yes. Why? Look me in the eyes. Does she shudder to see it idle on the wall? Is the master humiliated by its exposure? My child, trouble comes from far and near. I struggle to remain silent, but out of pity, I hold my tongue. Last night, fate through Aphrodite's godly lips, decreed, take down your husband's bow and announce a contest to the suitors. Whoever casts an arrow through 12 axe heads will take you as his wife. And now, shepherd, I bring it eagerly to you to rub down with fat and make it pliable. My good master, you dropped out of sight and everyone has deserted you. Hey, you. Be quiet. What are you groaning about? I am going to speak if it kills me. Swineherd, you, an aged man who with clenched fists thrashed the earth and yearn for an open grave, grasp the meaning of my words. What a bewildering, pretentious thing is fame, which openly sweeps through villages and lands, offering herself to every passerby, giving birth to hordes of bastards. Penelope was renowned and revered throughout this dismal earth. Bent over her home's hallowed heart, we imagined her faith, preserving the sacred flame and listening in the far distance to the sea, weeping for her welfare. With raised hands, we prayed, grant the same to me, O Zeus, that my heart be pure, that I may leave behind such a vigilant wife in my house. Immortals, hear me, oh, forget it. 
Words like meat and blood and gods are hungry for chunky thighs wrapped in fat. Fate divulges against my will my home's innermost secrets. Treat them with reverence, stranger. I'm the only one who has right to reveal them. Telemachus, it's about time you show whose son you are. What's on your mind? Be quiet. I dread your fixed, unbending stare, my boy. Enough, old man. On my shoulders, I feel the dead man's weight. It's time to stand on my own two feet and carry my own weight. Just as he too sought freedom, I follow in his footsteps. So what do you intend? End your father's bow before your parental doorstep and shout, Is this how you carry away or distance's widow? The gods gave me a mind to judge what I'm capable of. Do it right, and you come out a winner. Speak clearly. Don't beat around the bush. Let fate choose her new husband, and I swear her dowry will be returned intact. Why govern my life any longer? What if your illustrious father lived? If alive, together, like a lion and its cub, we would engage the enemy. But look who now remain faithful. Forget them. Better on one's own. I never placed much faith on supporters, but relied on mind and bow. Oh, you were you a dog, you would be a rabbit. You miss? I order you to harness it with bull-like strength, lest overuse shatter it. You sound like a fortune teller. No, not a fortune teller, no. But you're not Daedalus. <laughs> you're right, I'm not. You resemble... Yes, the look, the height, the shoulders. <laughs> like putty in my hand. I shape and reshape the mind of man and imbue it with my indomitable spirit. I am the Rapthon, the glory of the archive whom the great Agamemnon trusted to guard his faithless wife, <laughs> the fool. From her, I learn, from her I learned the countless deficiencies of mortal. And when the great leader stood victorious before his palace's indifferent door, I bowed before him and taking his massive hands in mine, secretly paid my respect and entreated him as a general. Hold your longing and aim to bludgeon with your solemn mind the cunning viper that lurks before you. Commander, a bloody bath awaits your exalted, undefeated body. And the pale prophetess Cassandra, death's most precious flower, forsaken by God, groaned at his feet. But who can vanquish me? Hey. Like a bull, he bellows in the bath and is slaughtered. And I said, I Curse the earth, the sun, the merciless and indifferent gods who on Olympus and drink without respect for mortal bearing and pray injustice on their knees. I'm appalled at all the cursing. Tell us more. And the sky reverberated, but I laughed. Hey, Zeus, debaucher of our women, I shouted. What are you thundering about? I stripped and exposed you as nothing more than a scarecrow in space and like a proprietor enter without fear to harvest Earth's wide orchard. And you're not afraid? <laughs> of who? My struggles made me bold and taught me, my boy, to rely only on myself and endure. Words are intrepid, but only deeds count. Get to know the heart of man. They're laughing, do you hear? They party with your household maids and the suitors mock you. What are you waiting for? If your father isn't within you, where do you think he is? Can you bend his mighty bow? And Odysseus has arrived. If you can't, he hasn't come, and I assure you, he never will. Where are you going? Home. Your words have scorched my brain, and shame reddens my cheeks. I'll attack. God be my witness. I'll get rid of them openly. So people will praise me and say, Odysseus sprouts new buds, and his son doesn't shame his father. Don't be in a hurry. Allow the deed to ripen in your mind and give it time to fall like a mellow fig from its bough. 
I despise whoever is quick to act. And I despise the one who waits forever. Time to put an end to haughty words. Head straight home and plot her lamb to Athena to counsel you wisely. For the mind should always treat madness, secret, and in self. Like a son, I kiss your shoulders and your hands. Come to the palace early in the morning. Assist me in whatever the goddess asks. An old man's opinion befits the young, old timer. He must have fallen asleep, duped by his dream. What a mess. <laughs> old chap, I bow before your sainted knees and pray that Athena enlighten your pallid mind to see in me your son restored. Alone with you, my heart, once again. Hold tight the helm, don't be afraid. My son hastens to free himself from his father, and my faithful wife seeks a new playmate to bear him thumbs as if I never existed. A am I not standing on my own patch of earth? Ancestors, are you looking down at me? <laughs> Somehow I found foreign lands more agreeable and friendly. Alas, why abandon that goddess? What if I did forget my country? I was living through happier times, reclining by her side like an endless river, every evening by the sea. Oh, if only the journey could begin again. I recall the sirens and icing thongs which, like kisses, rob the fortunate of their manhood. Oh, in the moonlight, their ample breasts erect like circular shields of battle. Shame, Odysseus. Get over yourself and silence your memory of a simpering siren. With Calypso, I could have been immortal, or stay with Circe and live like a beast. But I held the tiller steady between the two precipices focused on man's fate. Oh, I kiss your hands, your feet, your revered head and tarnished eyes. Bless me, Father. Let my mind sprout new roots that I may stand without fear silently on the threshold of my home. All sleep. I sleepless all night long, lamenting this wretched bow, which tomorrow will twang a stinging arrow at my master's heart. Athena, grant that I witness their deaths with the courage I presently muster, and I will sacrifice a gilded yearling heifer on your temple to satiate your thirst. How this old timer sways my heart. Don't lose it, Eumaeus. Don't be afraid. Patience, your turn will come. As long as you're an anvil, bide your time. But when you become a bullet, strike and keep a log of what takes place in your memory, good or bad. So, for those who've read the Odyssey, that scene is riveting in many ways um, because it, let's say for lack of better words, remixes and, and really revisits the reunions in the Odyssey. Um, and, you know, in the Odyssey, what happens is Odysseus goes from book 13, he goes to see Eumaeus, he stays in disguise, Telemachus comes to Eumaeus's home, or hut as is often translated, and the father and son are reunited. Um, and then there's a slow uh, staging until he's reunited with everybody. One of the most famous scenes in, in literary tradition, really, is when Eurycleia sees Odysseus's scar and it turns into this uh, reverie of his past. It's this moment of identification. And this pattern is repeated in the Odyssey. He meets someone, he lies to them, he talks to them. There's an external token that confirms his um, identity. And this just happens until he's reunited with everybody. But here, 
in this really marvelous scene, we get this combination of Odysseus who remains in disguise, a Eurycleia who's, who's introduced, a Eumaeus and um, uh, Telemachus. And it's like a weird family reunion where people don't know what's going on. But the speeches, they're just filled with amazing things. So Maria, one of the things I was really reflecting on is how uh, not quite florid, uh, but powerful the language is. Like it's 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 really drawing on motifs and themes from ancient Greek poetry, but there's more there. Um, so there are a couple of speeches you said you found like sort of really moving. Um, Eurycleia's and Odysseus's monologue here. What are some of the things you hear as a Greek speaker and as a as a Hellenist of the past? Uh, I think as you rightly said, we. We see some things that ha have changed in uh, Kazantzakis' uh, reworking of uh, the Odyssey because this is what Kazantzakis uh, um, uh, wanted to do. Uh, let us also be reminded that, uh, that uh, Kazantzakis' Odyssey is somehow what we say a highly revised version mm -hmm. of Homer's uh, Odyssey. Uh, and again, I must say that although in uh, uh, the English translation we cannot see the real use of the demotic of the original demotic uh, language because unfortunately we lose a lot, we see that it uh, it picks up where Homeric epic left off, and only to subvert every traditional element of the Homeric text. So. Kazantzakis wanted to do something new, but on in uh, but also he wanted to uh, use uh, Homer as uh, a foundation. Mm. Uh, one thing that I have to point out is that Kazantzakis did, in a way, things differently. First, he wrote the uh, he composed to be, <laughs> uh, this is the correct uh, term. He composed his Odyssey when he was very young, like in uh, 1924, and this lasted until 1938. But then he translated with Kakridis, Homer, uh, Homer's Iliad, during the German occupation of Greece. Mm. Uh, which again, uh, uh, this is again a big topic. Let's uh, put it aside for the, uh, for uh, for the time being, but he really lived through very definitive moments, not only for Greece but also for mankind. Okay, so here we see that, as you said, he in, a, in he changes the usual Homeric motive of identification, of meeting, and in general, what we 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 usually call a staple scene in Homer. Eurycleus says that, you know, if my master comes, he will come as disguised, he will look at the surroundings without being known to everyone, he will see who is taking advantage of his fortune, he will see who is um, using uh, the power uh, to govern. So we see also a different Eurycleia. Uh, Eurycleia anticipates what uh, Odysseus uh, will do, but it's a different kind of woman. Mm. Uh, perhaps you as a Homerist, you are able to say more and uh, about uh, how he has and that is formed Eurycleia as a female figure. Well, I think, you know, what people often will say about Eurycleia is that she's a stand-in for Anticleia, and the names of the same Odysseus's mother. Um, but this Eurycleia has much more agency, and I think, like, fullness, right? The Eurycleia in the Odyssey, what we hear about her um, is that Laertes, Odysseus's father, bought her when she was young, and she was worth many cows, but he didn't sleep with her. Right. But then we have this silence and Toph Marshall might want to talk about this later about like what happens to her next because she nurses Odysseus and the ancients knew like you don't nurse a child if you haven't had a child. So she has some sort of life there in the background. And I really think that Odysseus's lines there where he talks about her sagging breasts and gray hair and then he uses language for her hair that's it's not quite erotic, um, but it's definitely giving her like a personhood. 
Um, he, he's pointing to like that, the questionable stuff about her status, right? So in the Odyssey, like she sees Odysseus and the scene that people don't usually talk about is she, she barks out loud. She makes a noise and then Odysseus grabs her by the throat and threatens to kill her. And then immediately she later she becomes the one who informs on the other enslaved women and tells them which ones were loyal. So, you know, in many of the sort of receptions of, of Greek myth, you get sort of life breathed into these characters. And your play is really fascinating there. But I'm also really interested in, and you pointed this out to me in the chat, um, in Odysseus's monologue that we just had. Because what it really does is it speaks to so many of those latent anxieties in the Odyssey. Like many times in Odyssey books one, two, and three, um, uh, Telemachus says, well, I guess my father's dead, or I wish he were dead. Like he tries to will a resolution. And then we know in the Odyssey, there's this uncertainty about Penelope. And any other latent myth um, later said, well, she actually wasn't faithful. And all of this really emerges in this speech here. Um, and, you know, Rene will talk to him later. I mean, this, he did a great job of it. Uh, but Odysseus, he, he's almost to me suitably mad here, like suitably out of his mind for someone who's been suffering for so long, right? Whereas the Homeric Odysseus, like he's really all together for someone who, who suffered for 10 years at sea. Uh, what else do you see in this scene? Uh, well, I, as you you rightly said, uh, Odysseus, uh, Kazantzakis is Odysseus, because we're not talking about Homer's Odysseus. Kazantzakis' Odysseus is, uh, uh, seems to be more affected about, uh, from inward, of, of, uh, from his absence, than Homer's uh, Odysseus. Uh, he and again uh, another subversion that we saw in uh, the previous part of uh, our wonderful performance is that he, in a way, he 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 doesn't believe that he is in he he, he can't uh, realize he doesn't acknowledge his own uh, uh, homeland, mm. uh, and here. Uh, he's wondering, I mean, like he's, uh, uh, he's uh, defying himself, like he say, oh, am I not standing on my own uh, patch of earth? He, he'll, so yeah. he, in a way, he thinks like, oh, why do I have to go through this? I mean, what's, what's the, what's the aim? I'm not saying that he, um, uh he's wondering but it 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 it's it certainly there is a, something like a, either an internal conflict or definitely this is a different audition than the one that we that we are usually encountering mm -hmm. uh in uh, uh homer's odyssey yeah and, and i think you know, one of the things people often say that I think is definitely wrong about ancient literature is that the characters don't have what we now call uh, uh, interiority, right? Um, instead, like I think audiences help to build that in and their responses and the way they imagine the lives of the characters. Um, but this is really modern in a way um, that that um, we see in Odysseus sort of the impact of the trauma and what he's taking back and all of the all of the suspicions um, that you would carry with you. Um, so I, th I think it's it's fantastic in that way. Um, the way, you know, uh, Nikos would take a, a line or an idea that's just there in Epic or something else and build it into something uh, really, really marvelous. Um, and so I, I wonder, I mean, uh, uh, how, go ahead. Let me just pick on what you just said. This is exactly what Kazantzakis does. Mm. So he takes one, as you said, one bit, one word, one motive, and he tries to build something bigger. I mean, this is Kazantzakis like a literary program mm. in what sense? Again, a piece of information. Uh, Kazantzakis studied law and then he wrote a PhD on uh, Nietzsche's philosophy about uh, uh, jurisdiction and, uh, and law. But in a way, he was interested about uh, philosophy and religion. So he wrote, for example, he translated uh, Friedrich Nietzsche's uh, Also Sprache Zarathustra. He was also interested in Buddhism. Uh, he was interested in, 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 in different religions. He was also, of course, as a, a Greek Orthodox, he was also interested in his own religion, but he didn't accept religion as, as a fact. 
mm. he was in bank religions he was so he he read i think uh the lives of buddha and so on like like epics because he wanted to be informed and he wanted to see the philosophy be behind the religion and uh what he does whether you believe it or not in his odyssey he is trying to combine these elements uh from eastern religions with uh, uh, and to embed them within uh the broader uh modern epic so mm. this is exactly what you said this is what he does he he takes a motive that he read a motive that he uh, lived throughout his um uh, travels because he traveled in china he traveled in uh, uh, many unique uh, places uh, and uh, he wants to use all the, this material for his uh, for his epic and what what i love about his working progress process is that i actually think this is similar to what to how the Iliad and the Odyssey emerged in antiquity, is that they absorbed things from all the audiences and communities that are part of the storytelling um, to make something that was vibrant and urgent and of the moment. We're just so far removed, it's hard, it's hard to, to see it. Um, so it's sort of like, the, we're going to move to the, the final scene um, today, and we can talk about it more. Um, but how do you see um, sort of the closing of this play? Um, setting us up for preparing us to read um, the longer Odyssey and modern sequel. How do do I see this? Yeah, there are some moments or triggers there that help us understand where Kazanakis is going with Odysseus. Um, I think we're, we are able, I mean, there are some gradual moments. For example, mm -hmm. Telemachus' reaction, Eurycleas' reaction, also Eumaeus. Uh, his reaction about uh, uh, when Odysseus tells him that you know I am Odysseus, but he 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 is able to believe it. Um, in a way, he because that is, is uh, prepares us about what is going to follow. In what sense that Odysseus is not going to be content with just coming home. Mm and being with his family and we see that from um, um uh, from what he says how, what he uh, how he's reacting uh, i'm not saying that he is uh, scolding his own i'm not implying that he's scolding his own people but he's uh, but kazanzakis is uh, uh odysseus is, is always on the move both in with his own world i mean his own world is is like like a sea mm. a sea is always on the move okay so this is what cousin texas odysseus uh is it's it's like a sea both uh within himself and also outside he he's, he likes to be on 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 the move and this is what fits him and I think this is a great way to sort of transition to the end of the Odyssey, because the man himself, the figure Odysseus, is someone who will never stay still. Um, so in this final scene, we're going to start with Penelope and Odysseus together for the first time. Um, and in, the, in between, Odysseus has gotten back into the household, and we're setting ourselves up uh, for um, the story's violent end. You seem one with insight, old man, and yet you neglect to respect your age, dancing naked before young men. There are many ways for a mortal to earn his bread. I think it a disgrace to go to such lengths unnecessarily. And now, if you desire, I'll order the maids to treat you to some sweet wine and meat. If you are Penelope's heavenly form, my eyes are overjoyed. I journeyed to many lands and towns and had my fill of beautiful women. Ah, oh, like a neophyte, I'm overwhelmed by longing. I tremble sweetly before you, my lady. Tell me, did you see Helen of Sparta? She must be more beautiful than me. The slot, the men she buried. 
and yet her fame is world-renowned, and she remains an object of desire. Your fame, ladies, surpasses reckless Ellen's. The earth that nurtures you rejoices like soil sprouting an all-white lily. You're like one of the columns in your husband's palace, which upright holds up the ceiling. You stand sleepless like a lamp and light up with patience both the upper and lower stories. You administer with care animals, slaves, the cooking, and measure out each task. Your home functions blissfully to the cadence of the loom, and you tell the maids, hoping to retrace your good husband, I dreamed last night of a scarlet robe. He romps with wealthy rakes and sways them like a god he dons assorted robes. In the marketplace, he's admired by all the nobles he meets in conversation because I'm told, read the notes, pick of mine. <laughs> and now that I see before me that heavenly wonder of life, I shout, <laughs> blessed be the earth that bore you, lady. Immortals holding contempt too much pride. And one should live humbly. That, I believe, is within man's reach, whether rich or poor. Fate's directive returns me time and again to that beaten path, and I don't put money on too much accolades. I'm not a goddess, but a frail mortal. Lady, for your sake, I take an oath. In war, I was forgiving and released the warriors and slaves I captured. Perhaps a Penelope sits faithfully on his threshold waiting. I pondered and felt compassion. And now, before you, in your home, lady, I cursed man's stock. Yet, mulling over the mortal heart, I judge man's decency with sympathy. Beautiful as you are, it's a pity to wait so many years for a husband. I understand that faithfulness is a virtue, but should respond to the needs of passion. Imagine how many encircling suitors desire you, my lady. Whisper in Aphrodite's ear the one you favor. You know her empathy, she'll listen. And only my strength was once as it used to be in my early reckless youth. I would seize hold of that deadly bow with my own hands. You're too old. Make room for younger men. Don't stand in my way. What is to be will be. We're all slaves to fate. Freedom, how you overflow like a holy spring from within necessity's dark bowels to refresh my idle mind. <clears throat> it's time, my queen. The twelve axe heads stand ready and waiting. Hand over the bow to the suitors. Penelope hands the bow over to Eumaeus, who takes it to the suitors, who take turns trying to string it, and they fail one by one. They try to warm the bow by the fire, to grease it up with oil, and one by one, the suitors fail to achieve their aims, standing around, looking, waiting for what happens next. Patience. I'm tired of waiting. What's your rush? I'm no longer satisfied bending to an old man's whims. Son. Who is it? It's me, son. Who? <laughs> Telemachus, I'm back. Bolster your heart, brace your knees, lest they buckle. Let your eyes behold. Odysseus. Father. Uh, stand back. Be a man and hold your joy. Don't shout. Double bar the doors and stay alert. I'm going to signal soon. What are you staring at? You too must be overjoyed at my lady's wedding. Humaeus, my dog recognized me, but not you, my faithful servant. Oh my. Whose voice is that? Don't shout. Move aside, swineherd. I didn't return to my neg neglected palace to die, but to kill. Look into my eyes. Look at the scar on my thigh. Remember, I'm Odysseus. 
No, no, my faithful swineherd, we have neither time to laugh nor cry. Hold back your feelings and listen. Close off the upper and lower feet and remove the arms from the walls. If anyone asks why you're taking them down, say, uh, I'm afraid you might all get drunk and embroil the wedding in blood. When I signal, bring me the bow. You on my left, my son on the right, and sit tight. Right, Athena, please. Good God, who might that be in our courtyard? His penetrating look bores into my eyes. Antinous, you should recall how my husband took hold of the bow in his hands. Slowly, he drew his right arm back, taut and tight like a bull's thigh, until it gently touched flesh at his shoulder. And what force his dark chest dispatched, instantaneous without sweating, secretly clenching his teeth, the lightning fast twanging arrow flew with ease like a ravenous crow as it passed through all twelve axe heads. You pursue us like virgin Artemis dispatching hunting dogs after prey. May Procurus Aphrodite endow me with children from your ample bosom that one day I may be worthy to lay deep roots in you for my descendants. Antinous, I like how wisely you meld desire with right. Now I lean over your shoulder and counsel you willingly not to waste time. Kneel and draw through the 12 ax heads and I'm yours. You were the one I favored in heart and mind. But no longer will I escape the arms of handsome Antinous. Laertes. Lovingly, I receive you, father. Welcome again to your palace. To what do we owe the pleasure? But didn't you send for me, my child? I did. Didn't you send a blue-eyed maiden for me who had an olive wreath in her hair? No, father, I didn't send anyone for you, but you're more than welcome now that you're here. Bring out the high chair, maids. Move, old timer, help him on the chair. I'm grateful to whomever with a lie welcomes you to the palace. A gentle breeze brings my heart back to life. A heavenly virgin, a maiden, like a queen gently took me by the hand and spoke in such a delicate soft voice that soothed my mind and a tranquil light assailed my being. Grandfather, they await you at the palace and I will lead you by the hand until your elderly body of its own accord rejuvenates by the time you arrive and sit upon your throne. And I, leaning on her all-white shoulder, took to the road step by step and sensed such nimbleness that I thought my feet had sprouted wings. As I moved along, the fresh air shed light on everything and confusion melted in the sun, like morning mist. His mind is back. How alert his speech and eyes are once again. Miracles have their source. It is clear that some god accompanied him here. Athena, I discern your spotless hand hearing the speech before it and enlightening my father's mind. Such unparalleled goodness I never hoped to be. I'm afraid a trembling comes over me. You'd think a god is passing silently like an eagle in flight. Hey, maid, fetch me my golden cup. Suddenly my heart missed a beat, as if some wing brushed against my shoulder. And you, why do you shuffle about like a thief with sidelong glances and chatter incessantly? Hey, swineherd, why are you hiding our arms? I'm afraid if you get drunk, you'll cause a bloodbath. Uh, bring wine, fill the glasses, let the swineherd be, and drink to the new groom-to-be. Uh, a toast. For this grubby beggar too. Today I want to shine even among the lowest of the low. That like the sun with unvarying, brilliant intensity illuminates the earth. And you, good Aphrodite, 
who inflates men's hunger and lustful apples and inflames adolescent eyes, come with a smile and loosen fair Penelope's chastity belt. Shake not your gloomy head, old beggar. Lift your cup and drink a toast to Aphrodite. Which Aphrodite? Know that my mind is not preoccupied with Cyprus's maidens, nor Bed's pleasures. Other gods will sway over me. Athena, I call on you, indomitable virgin, who soars full grown from the head of humanity's crater like an all-embracing fire, wisdom, and strength. My God, I feel a net flung around me, and I believe I detect the fisherman. Maids, bring me my ancestral cup, fill it with wine, and pay attention. It's time for the grandfather to offer greetings. Modest goddess, again a thousand times, welcome to my polluted home. I pour three drops of black wine on the earth. First for the grandfather, another for the absent son, a third for the youthful grandson, and I shout to my dead ancestors who have shriveled from thirst and to my family roots thriving within the earth. Open wide your mouths and drink. Act quickly, no time to lose. Fate passes hurriedly through my courtyard entirely out of patience and yells, hey braggart, don't take so long, take your turn, muscle men. Fate's footsteps are getting louder on the flagstones. Okay, no need to shout. I'm in a hurry also to get into your mother's bed. Oh, Fate, incline towards courageous men, come to me now with a victor's wreath. The rest of you stand against the wall. I'm taking aim. Who's laughing? Who's hissing like a snake? Don't look at me. You jinx me, you old geezer. Why are the doors bolted? Open them. Open up. I need air. I'm furious. And you, why are you armed? The wine has gone to your head and made you giddy. Put down the massive bow. Mother, don't stand around so many drunks. It's time... You visit Athena's idol altar in reverence and rekindle its fading flame. Tonight for her, I sacrifice a hecatomb. Any of you great men worthy of filling Odysseus's bed remain where you are. The gods keep their word. The wedding table will not be stripped. Eurycleia and the rest of you women quickly, I order you, retire upstairs and should you hear any cries, keep the doors locked. The men alone will handle what transpires. Master of the house, stay seated up on your high throne. Custodian of our home and our family source like Zeus. Bless your son and grandson from your lofty throne. Telemachus, I believe it's proper for the revered queen to stay. I'll press the gods to confirm that the fated wedding take place. One more suitor remains. Have patience, lady, I beg you. Proceed, master of the house, your turn has come. My heart aches. Something strange is going on. I can't do it. Someone's cursed me. You, Penelope, were fated to remain abandoned in your solitary bed lamenting. But don't cry. A thousand other ways are known to the beloved of goddess, and she will unite us. <laughs> Leave the bow bo alone. Bring it back. I'm the householder. I give the orders. Shepard, hand the bow to the old timer that he may evoke his youth. Odysseus. Welcome, fine gentlemen. Where are you off to? The doors are bolted. Bridegrooms, the wedding in my wide courtyard is about to begin. Wife, hide in a corner in the chaos of slaughter and arrow. Be mindful, lady, might injure you. I'm Odysseus. My trusty bow recognizes me, and in my hands it longs for action. Exultingly, the bowstring hums like a swallow. In my ponderous hands, death brings peace like a thunderbolt. In the hand of justice. 
Not one of you will escape once he's on the island. I know the cunning rogue he is. He's patient, evasive, and suddenly at the right moment when you least expect it, he's on top of you. Merciless will be the slaughter on your heads. If you run away, he'll still catch you and lynch one after another in the courtyard. Your delicate little hands won't even have time to touch his knees in supplication. I pray to you, Mistress Aphrodite, of the unbridled sea, deny his homecoming. So that brings us to the end of what's really an abbreviated reading of a much longer play that anticipates, as we said earlier, a very long um, exploration of Odysseus's post-Odyssey exploits. Um, in antiquity, um, the stories went on for years. He's attached with uh, you know, to princesses all throughout central and northern Greece. He has up to 19 or 20 named children throughout the world. Um, and authors like Tennyson and others sort of grabbed on that, the idea that this man could never truly be domesticated. Um, so we've got 10 or 15 minutes left. So I'd like to bring in some of the actors right away to talk about this. And I, maybe we'll start with the man himself, Odysseus. So Renee, um, your your Odysseus, uh, if you can come in, there you go. Your Odysseus had that combination of play and menace um, that was really effective. So I, I, you know, this probably the first time you've ever seen this play. When you were reading it, what did you think? What were you going through um, as you encountered this character? Um, I really liked it. Uh, it was something very sort of contemporary and accessible about it, um, and it was. You know, sometimes in these Greek plays, the characters can be quite stock. Um, yeah. And so it was fun to have somebody who had some surprises. But you, I mean, you know, and I think you, you there is this sort of ex, exalting in the violence and the vengeance at the end. Um, was, was that something you saw in the text? Is it something you and Paul and others ta talked about when you were producing it? Or what, um, what, what was I, going on? It, for me, it was there in the text you know it just yeah. seemed like he this you know we we kept joking in rehearsal about because at the end it says you know something like and Odysseus appears blazing like a god so, <laughs> so I was like well let's see what happens if we try to play like well, and I mean that's really one of the things that that I enjoyed about this play and your performance I um, mean Maria I'd love to have you have you join me here is that you know Odysseus's character in the Odyssey is known for you know famously as being polytropos, right? And the way we translate that, many weighed, many formed, many minded, it's really hard to figure out what it means. But I think part of what it means is this is a character with different layers and aspects, and audiences and performers choose to sort of pick them out. And so this play really, I mean, Odysseus is the returning Avenger still, um, but he's menacing. Right. And so, Maria, I was wondering, I mean, this reading of Odysseus, do you see it as sort of being countercultural in Greece or is this emerging out of um, the period that he was writing in? Like, how do you see this version of Odysseus? I think that Kazantzakis uh, uh, is Odysseus, uh, in a way, um, captures what Kazantzakis uh, um, experienced uh, during this period. Mm -hmm. Let us not forget that uh, when he started composing his Odyssey in 1924, uh, the First World War was over, but still uh, we were in between the First and the Second World War. The, um, the big economic crisis of 1929 uh, was yet to come, but still there was some sign that the there, there was something uh, wrong. Also, another thing that it is important for reading this work is that uh, Kazantzakis, um, during his early years, he was uh, a socialist. So he, in a way, saw the uh, the revolution that uh, took place in uh, in uh, former Russian Empire after the 1917 uh, revolution, the, the Soviet Union was a unique uh, uh, a, a unique event in in all in all aspects. Mm. Uh, although he was not uh, a committed uh, 
member of uh, the party, uh, Kazantzakis believed that socialism was probably the, the only way for humanity to, uh, to live and, uh, and in, in, a, in a way to, to find uh, justice. However, he, uh, he was also a literary figure, so mm -hmm. he was less embroiled in, the, in politics. So in his um, um, uh, Odysseus, we see as uh, uh, René splendidly performed him that his Odysseus is he he puts uh, th th uh, things to go further and to go forward. Mm. Uh, this is probably one of Kazantzakis' beliefs that uh, men should always strive to go forward. Um, he, he, and let us not forget that his uh, epigram on, uh, um, on his uh, tomb, on his grave is that I believe nothing, I hope nothing, I'm free. So for him, freedom is uh, an ultimate principle and an ultimate goal. Mm. Uh, and by not hoping and uh, nothing means that uh, this doesn't seem that doesn't mean that we don't have to go forward in order to in order not to fulfill our dreams and our goals quite the opposite but we should not expect and with hope he, he means expectation so what Odysseus does is he uh, prompts his Odysseus to take action and do what he has to do in order to go further, to be re-engaged in his traveling. Yeah. Of course, of course, we will see that if we read the whole uh, uh, poem. And I think what's really fascinating about so having Odysseus as a character, if we're trying to sort of figure out uh, Kazanakis's like space between being a socialist and a literary figure, is that Odysseus is often seen as sort of stand in for oligarchic interests or monarchic interests in the early times. And, you know, there's nothing. I mean, he's just a, a, the singular murderous figure in this play. Um, so I, I want to bring in a couple of people before we turn to announcements. Uh, but Eunice, um, you, you've played all the greats, all the big characters. Here you got to be Penelope, but a very different Penelope. And one of the notes we have from YouTube um, is that this is a harsh take on Penelope, um, unless, of course, she knows what's going on ahead of time. Um, coming to this play with all of your knowledge and experience, what was your view of Penelope? Um, I, I don't think, well, I, I sense that she didn't come with any knowledge of what was going to happen. And, and, you know, I think she is unsh un unsure because you get it in the script when the pennies start to fall. So I think I think at the beginning, um, I mean, without any great, I have to say, without any great knowledge behind any of this, um, you have to play what's there on the page. And um, what's there on the page is that she doesn't know, mm. you know, when she sees Odysseus. And, but I think when she does get the suitors, or the suitor in this case, you know, um, she, she will go for that. And and I think that's a matter of survival as well. Yeah. But yeah. unlike some of the other women, um, when the husband returns, I think she's also quite pleased <laughs> that, that happens, you know. <laughs> yeah. No, and I think what I like again about this play and, and the approach is that it, it again looks for that open space <clears throat> in the epic where we get several moments. Telemachus says it and others that, oh, Penelope might actually prefer one of the suitors. Um, and if we imagine reality, like 10 years, how, how long can you be expected to wait for a guy like you knew 20 years ago, right? I mean, it, it's a stra <clears throat> strange thing to ask. Um, but, and I, I wanna get everybody involved. So Phil, if, if you're still there, um, this was your first time with us. And I'm just wondering, so new material, new crew, what was the experience like of coming in and jumping in on this character, Antinous? Yeah, fantastic. Thanks so much for having me as well. Um, it, um, first of all, it's so interesting working with a script where the stage directions are about turning on your um, microphone or your, uh, you know, your video. Uh, that's that's a that's a fun bit, and you know, lighting our walls behind us. You know, it's all quite um, it's all quite different, but it was really fascinating to be a part of it, and it was such a 
uh, such a privilege to be able to listen to um, you guys' interjections as well and be able to, you know, um, benefit from all that kind of wisdom and, and, and work that you guys have done over many years, I'm sure. And in terms of the character, it was such a fun character. But, you know, it's he's a bit like um, that sort of, you know, uh, Gaston from Beauty and the Beast meets <laughs> Jesus. Jesus when he disguises himself as a beggar, or the Duke yeah. in Measure for Measure. You know those yeah. kind of uh, the, those kind of classic, overly confident, sort of slightly nasty, braggart like character who who are often insulting to somebody tr- dressed as a beggar or somebody in disguise, and then only to to come to their downfall. So it's kind of quite easily recognisable from that sense from other you know great stories, and that was quite exciting. Yeah, and you you really you leaned into that. I like that that Gaston figure pr- pretty well, um, and it really I think it brought out like you know one of the things that's that that's important when you're reading the Odyssey aloud is how you think about the suitors, right? Are we going to give them individuation? Are we going to allow them to be people? Are we going to make them stock characters? And I think there's that tension there at the end of this play that that you and Renee played off of each other really well. Um, so thank you. Uh, it's great to have you here. Um, oh, and, thank you, thank you thank so you. much. And, and Toph. You're here again, Eumaeus. I know I've ref- I mentioned you before because you're the only person I've read who's written about Eurycleia and her breastfeeding of Odysseus, um, which is something we could talk about some other time. But it's something that people don't talk about, especially not Homeric scholars in general, because I think they have nothing to do with child rearing until the past two generations or so. Um, but tell me a little bit about your view, how your view of Eumaeus may have changed from this performance. Well, in the Odyssey, I, I think we really like Eumaeus and, and Eumaeus is warm and he's kindly and he's he he's the one that I think the poet, you know, ha- has this fondness for. And I'm going to say I didn't see that in the script. <laughs> no matter how often I wanted to be warm and gentle and sweet, I'm just yelling at people and telling them to shut up and uh, performing stage directions. But I but I I, I think that's because um, there's there's more interesting things going on and and the play really does bring out uh, these really, really rich images um, in the language yeah. that uh, I, I, I think, uh, you know, the other actors uh, really get to uh, explore. Uh, Eumaeus does get this one um, image about, uh, you know, the fig ripening on the branch. And uh, I, I really enjoy that. <laughs> well, I think a, a part of the character of Eumaeus, like one of the questions about him is how does he survive and thrive regardless of what's going on right and the answer is the uh, in the in the in homer's odyssey is loyalty and love of master right he's this perfect enslaved person right well in this play i sort of get the sense that like it's staying on task doing his job and knowing his place in a way that makes him seem more like an everyman from the 20s and 30s mm. than sort of the Umayan swineherd. Um, but so moving from that, so so I, we could talk about this play for probably the full length of the full epic, uh, 33,000 lines. Um, but we're over time. I want to keep going, though, because we've got you and Mary Ebbett here who are involved in our next few performances. Um, so tell us about the play you're bringing us in a few weeks. Well, in December, we're going to be reading Amphitro by Plautus, a Roman comedy. Now, I know that everyone live listening to this uh, live stream right now are furiously tweeting you, Joel. How can you do a Roman comedy when this is reading Greek tragedy online? And that is a good question. And in fact, the god Mercurius wants it to be a tragedy. In the prologue, he says, I'll first announce what I came here to ask. Then I'll describe this tragedy's events. What's that? You squint your brow since tragedy is what's to come? I'll change it. I'm a god. This same play from a tragedy. Tragedy, I'll make a comedy with every <laughs> verse the same. Do you want this or not? But I'm a dope as if a god, I didn't know your wants. I gather what your souls do wish to see. I'll mix it up, a tragic comedy. For me to make it comedy alone would not be right when gods come on and kings. What then? Since one role also is a slave, I'll make it tragic comic, as I said. So come on out in December, not for our GTO, but for our RCO. <laughs> And and uh, Tom, we'll, we'll be using we'll be using your translation, right? I think so. Yes. Okay, which is pretty exciting. And for those of you who don't know, Amphitryo is, is I think one of the funniest plays from antiquity. 
Um, and it'll be interesting to see how we get it working on the small screen. Um, so thank you. I, I'm looking forward to that. And maybe I said a few weeks because I'm trying to will ourselves to the end of the semester. Um, and Mary, who's here, so I want to introduce Mary Ebbett, um, another fabulous homerist from Holy Cross, not too far off from us here um, at, at Brandeis. Um, and you're doing something pretty cool there live with, with Iphigenia. I'd like to hear about that. But also, what are you going to be sharing with us in a few weeks? Right. So uh, Iphigenia at Holy Cross opens tomorrow. Um, and so we're going to be sharing um the script that I developed for that production with you all um, and hopefully um, show you a little bit of the production. And Iphigenia is a combination of Euripides, Iphigenia at Aulis with the Iphigenia among the Taurians um, back to back as one play. So, uh, <laughs> so that is um, what we're going to see here and talk about. That's that's awesome. Now, now I, we'll find out more about it. Um, but what what dates? And Paul, you want to jump in here because I didn't put the dates down. But when do we have Mary a, a, and Toph joining us? Um, so, <clears throat> so Mary um, is going to be joining us. It's in just over two weeks' time because actually mm -hmm. it's on Friday. It's on Friday the eighteenth of November um same time 3 p.m uh eastern time um but yes yeah, so if that's then Friday the 18th of November and Toff's Amphitruo will be closing our uh this season and that's on Wednesday the 14th of December and right in the middle of those two uh pretty much uh on Wednesday the 30th of November we will have a um uh, a performance of Agamemnon, which will be directed by Tabitha, who obviously mm -hmm. was with us today as Athena and Telemachus, but unfortunately had to run off. So those are our three remaining episodes for this season. Um, that sounds like an amazing uh, season, Paul. Thank you for bringing it together. Do you have any other announcements you want before we wrap up the day? I uh, just, uh, just, uh, well, just to say, please do, please, please do come back and uh, and watch all of those because we're so delighted that we're able to uh, share all these uh, very special things with everyone. Um, a reminder that in the spring, our plan is that we're going to be doing some in-person events. So if anyone out there is interested in having us come and visit to do talks, readings, workshops, or any combination of those, then do let us know. Um, it's lovely that we've got Eunice back with us, um, having performed so many roles. Um, Eunice is the Dean of Barda, so it'd be remiss of me not to also mention that uh, Barda, the British American Drama Academy's um, Greek theatre programme, is uh, applications are open for that, and it's an amazing course. And so please do check out the Barda website for that. Um, playing uh, playing back eye is uh, it's a competition that is open to all students in Greece. Um, so do please um, have a look on the Out of Chaos website and you can find out information about that. Soon we'll have some information. Um, we'll be announcing the winners from the Playing Dionysus competition, which um, has been uh, taking place in the US and Canada. And we hope to announce some more competitions soon as well. That's all for me. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, and th I'm looking forward to all of this. Um, I want to close by thanking people again. Maria um, came almost last minute. I gave you a few weeks notice and had more expertise than I could have dreamed for. I want to thank Costas Mercedes, who's traveling today or also would have joined us as well for sharing his translation. It came out on October 17th. Um, so just two weeks ago, and it's from, I'm forgetting which press, uh, Somerset Hall Press. It's available. It's a beautiful little edition. Um, and I want to thank everybody who makes this possible every week. Um, the uh, the whole team from the Cosmos Society, Ellen, um, Janet. Uh, Sarah, everybody, Allie for making this happen, Olivia who couldn't log in today, all the wonderful actors and producers who make this possible. Everyone stay safe if you're in the U.S. Uh, maybe vote over the next few weeks uh, because, you know, NEH and stuff is supported by um, our government. Um, and uh, other than that, take care of each other and we'll see you in two weeks. Oh, plus a few days.